Hello guys and gals, and welcome back to another episode of Haunted Gaming. This time we take a look at a creepypasta simply titled Meek, about a player who enjoys their video games a little too much. So with that being said, let's sit down and enjoy the tale of Meek. He sat at his computer, tongue licking his upper and lower lips in anticipation. A long nailed, fat and grimy index finger clicked on the mouse at a dizzying pace. An observer might have thought there was an insane miniature tap dancer somewhere underneath the piles of filth that surrounded the man. However, no tap dancer could effectively practice her talent in this cramped and deplorable dwelling. The apartment smelled old. Old food, old clothes, old sweat, and old urine. Older keepsakes from a time when Meek was a different man than the behemoth sitting behind the computer now. Peek through the places where the trash didn't take over. A narrow path wound its way around the dwelling, taking me to the vital places he needed to go when life interrupted. A path to the bathroom that was rarely used anymore, and another that forked 30 degrees to the apartment entrance. Others led to the kitchen and what might have once resembled a dining room. Another path ended abruptly in front of the bedroom's entrance, a ramp of filth almost reaching the smoke alarm above the door frame. The high amount of uh, detritus that formed these paths were monuments showing the sloth of the recent past. An involuntary story from the ground up, most of the bottoms of them were newspapers he used, back when caring seemed to be second nature, to soak up the vomit and spilled beer. After the insulating layers of refuse began to accumulate above them, however, the carpet became passé to his thoughts. An empty and flattened tampon box, whose corner jutted out from one of the disgusting hillocks near the computer, caught the corner of his eye. His wife, Mary, who left him uh, about a year or more ago, but he barely remembered what she looked like. Even the dust and grime-covered picture lying face up near the monitor offered a view of a woman he didn't really remember knowing. She took their infant daughter, Chrissy, Christy, or Krista, I don't know, with her as it became clear that Meek was quite incapable of anything besides playing his online game. He suddenly kicked a small mound of pizza boxes under his desk in frustration as his main game character fell into his demise of a ravine and into a pixelated lava below. The group he was running his, uh, his dungeon with would undoubtedly boot him out of the group for his failure to keep up. He kicked the mound again, his long, yellow, big toenail piercing a hole through the box uh, into what he perceived to be a wall beyond. The pain barely registered at first due to Meek seeing that his internet connection had been terminated. He stomped his other foot into the moist and brown colored spot on the floor to his left. A pungent smell that he had uh, all but become immune to ran through his nostrils. He glanced at uh, his fractured toenail, now resembling the misshapen tip of a bloodied spear. He grabbed the foot in pain and cursed the monitor before him, his game character a skeleton at the bottom of a molten orange doom. He worked hard to get his game character to this point, now this? Did he cut into the coaxial cable that supplied his internet access with his toenail? Did he kick something else? Bald headed Christ, fuck! He shouted onto the screen before him, a middle finger echoing with the mountains of garbage near him wouldn't let his voice do. He quickly stood, the crusty and stained seat cushion briefly sticking to his rear and bringing the chair up, and then down with a plastic wheeled bank. Trying to think quickly for a solution to his connectivity problem, he made his way along the kitchen path, slowly limping to the telephone. He was surprised at how much he'd been sweating. Was the AC broken too? He silently thanked his dead mother for the trust fund that she had left to him that sustained his living these past few years. He would call the landlady after the cable company. He became lightheaded as his overweight frame limped uh, along the refuse and vomited into an empty cereal box before entering the kitchen, grabbing a dusty and half-full beer off what must be the dining room table. He drank, expelling the acidic taste from his mouth. He dry heaved from the taste of the old beer, thankful to the taste of uh, puke no longer had lingered. He hadn't used the phone in ages, no need to, really. He used both hands to claw through some hamburger wrappers and matted paper towels to about where he estimated the phone to be. Several cockroaches scampered away at his touch, their surreptitious duties temporarily put on hiatus. He was correct in his assumption of where the phone should be. He was incorrect by thinking the phone was still there, however. He faintly remembered Mary saying how the phone's ringer woke up the baby at night. Since they could only afford a one-bedroom place at the time, the kid had to sleep in the living room. And since they both had cell phones at the time, the home phone was redundant. So did she move it? Put it away? Throw it out? Fuck me, he said as he picked a small, itchy brown piece of crust from the back of his leg, clawing at the skin underneath. His toe is bleeding worse now, the toenail much worse than he thought as he examined it at the brighter light of the kitchen. The nail cracked vertically all the way down, apparently breaking beneath the skin as well. His toe was easily twice the size it had been before the gimpy trek to the kitchen, a sickly wetting of purple and yellow. 
Meek didn't know the first place to look if Marie had put it, uh, put, it uh, put it away somewhere. And quite frankly, he didn't feel like digging through more mounds to look. Another option was a bedroom. There was a landline connection in there. Maybe it was buried somewhere in there? His desire to get back to his game, coupled with his throbbing foot, prodded him to go back and look. He wobbled along the bedroom path, straight down the hallway. The carpet he trod on, making sickening wet sounds. He paused for a glance to the bathroom he stopped using months ago. A brown, conical shape of a solid brown and green substance protruded with the grimy toilet. He could see several flies tending to their young among the shape, buzzing with parental defense as they sensed Meek's presence. Matted balls of toilet paper stood knee-high, occasionally broken by the mouths of empty beer bottles. The bottle tops almost looked like the brown mouths drowning in a sea of disgust. Smears and handprints of a darker color lined the titled walls. A picture hung by the entrance of the bathroom, Meek and Marie, standing in front of the lake at Epcot Center. The baby was nestled in Meek's arms, a peaceful shroud of sleep evident on her face as her happy father kissed her forehead. Was that taken before or after the wedding, he thought. He remembered that day. The baby cooing as the boat made its way through the tunnels in the Mexican section of the park. He had no idea why, but he also remembered Marie giving him a light but tender kiss on his neck as the boat sloshed its way through the artificial passages. He made his way through the bedroom entrance, having to limp way through trash that he didn't remember making. Glancing behind him, he noticed that he had left a red trail of his foot dragging behind him. Clearing the way to the door took longer than he had thought. There were several large boxes hiding beneath the garbage that were heavier than he had expected. Their contents unimportant. As the longing of getting back to his game took precedence over all else, they were stacked high as well, almost reaching where the door met the frame. Throwing the last box behind him down the hallway with a grunt, he grabbed the doorknob and tried to open the bedroom door. It was locked, and after several minutes of determination, a few pulls from his obese frame and many curses of frustration, the door gave way, splintering the frame and showering Meek's forearm with wooden debris. The room was cool, dark, and surprisingly clean. The light shone from the hallway behind him, exposing the most of dust that chaotically danced to the floor being thrust open. Had he really not come in here at all over that year or two? The carpet was a perfect beige, it was when his family moved in a few years ago. The pictures that Marie picked out still hung around the room. Partesian bitnik monstrosities that Meek still gave a disdainful glance to. She insisted that, since there were no windows in the room, she would make it as sunny as possible. The bed was made as well, the dark brown comforter looking nearly the same color as the putrid incontinence of the bathroom he had glanced at minutes before. The phone was on the nightstand on the side that Meek used to sleep on during cheerier times. With a sigh of relief that any heroin user could relate to after finally getting a reclusive fix, he limped over to the phone, one foot left a uh, bloody streak and the other left brown footprints on the unmarked carpet. Sitting down on the bed, he picked up the phone's receiver and started to dial when, the, when he noticed the square-shaped thing in the corner. Since he didn't think to turn the light on when he came in, and the hallway's light didn't reach the corner, he couldn't make out what it was. He gave his toe a rub, hand coming back bloody, and winced in pain as a dread of realization crept up on him. There was no dial tone. This could only mean one thing. Marie had canceled the service at some point without telling him, or more likely he didn't pay the bill after she left. He couldn't remember. Grabbing his phone in frustration, he threw it in the direction of the square-shaped thing, cursing. He was getting very lightheaded now, the coolness of the room doing little to alleviate the sweat drenching his balding, fleshy head. He stood and hobbled over the square thing in the corner. As he came up beside it, he grabbed the edge of it and winced in pain, his foot feeling as if it was on fire. He looked into the square thing, now realizing what it was, not just because of its physical shape as much as its contents. The long, de decaying corpse of an infant had laid in the center of the playpen. The skin almost resembled one of those purplish, super-hot peppers that he'd used, at the, uh, he used to see at the grocery store, making bizarre spiral patterns along the top of the skull. The infant had a permanent scream on its wrinkled and deformed face, as though it was seeing something horrible before its death. The horrible thing must have been loneliness. Meek thought as he had glanced at his daughter. The thought was quickly dashed, however, as he noticed another figure sitting upright in the darker corner beyond the crib, Marie's eyeless face pointing at the ceiling in a look of pain, as if she had died crying. One hand still rested on the corner of the playpen, the other pulling down the shirt where, his, where her breast had been. She must have been given the infant. Christina, that, that was her name! One last meal before she herself had expired. Cursing in worried anticipation, he picked up the phone, who was thankfully still in one piece with the cord from the wall still attached to it. He hobbled to the bedroom door, deciding he would try the kitchen phone's receptacle. Now out of a feverish desperation. As he made his way through the doorframe, he immediately saw a problem. The heavy boxes that he had thrown behind him in a frenzy moments before, now made a heavy wall that merged with the garbage piles. He could see a portion of his computer monitor beyond, a bubbly orange haze through cardboard interfuse. 
His foot throbbled, and his chest suddenly contorted in pain as self-preservation began to take hold of his fevered body. Dropping the phone, he fell to his hands and knees and crawled towards the barricade. The first box before him wasn't so bad to move, but the next was impossible. Positioned as he was, and he slumped over it, he sensed a cockroach that he must have only partially killed with his weight. Tickled to the side of his torso. Just a rest, he mumbled. The kitchen is just around the corner, so close. I'll have my internet back within the hour. Just one phone call, he thought. Longly looking at his computer screen through the cardboard and refuse cracks, his heart finally took his frustration, his toe pain, and him along with it. That was one of the more morbid creepypastas I've read in a while. Shit, it's, it's, it, it has been a while since that, you know? And man, the ending. Honestly, not only is the uh, concept for this you know, creepy, coupled with the imagery as well, which is really, really, really hard-hitting, but it's also very realistic. I mean, we've seen cases with many gamers, and I'm not just throwing in MMO players, or is it's every genre, hell, it's it's not just gamers in general, it's any hobby you can have, that uh, when you get into it, and you end up really do, you end up really neglecting people, or you know, throw, it can take over your life, when it, you know, things like addictions, it could be drugs, it could be video games, it could be anything in your life, you know, that if it takes addiction into what you do, and you need it as a dependency, rather as a hobby, then uh, it, it can take over your life in a very harmful way, as we do see here. And uh, again, we haven't we've seen this with Diablo players in the past. We've seen this with uh, you know World of Warcraft, and that's what the uh, you know game was generalized here as. Not entirely confirmed though, but you know we've seen this with any kind of game, Call of Duty, whatever. Meek, you know our protagonist, or who is a completely different person, you know, a set of protagonists, I should say antagonists, but let's move on here. Completely different person from what he, uh, you know, was a few years back, has turned into this different person who can literally just ignore life, as showcased by the filth and disgust in that ending where we, I guess I would have to say, is, you know, he had locked his family away and ignored them so he could get on with his video game, locking them away to their debts. It's not just sad, but unfortunately we've seen things like this, and now in this fucked up world of ours, is can be happening. I'm not going to go all, you know, public service announcement on you people, but because of the realism, it also makes this creepypasta even more creepier. It, ma it makes this creepypasta because when it tosses in a realistic concept, and for a gaming creepypasta where it's really hard to do that nowadays, it is done well. No demons, no hacked games, just one of the dark sides to gaming, and once again, not just that, but any hobby as well, or anything that can become an addiction. All in all, I thought it was nice and paced fluently. In the end, what would you rate this creepypasta and what would you change to make it better? This has been another episode of Haunted Gaming, and if you like what you saw, then like, comment, and subscribe. This is me, Mudahar, and I am out.